Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Contractor Evolution. Learning to write persuasively is a massively underrated skill and not something we've spent enough time on yet on the podcast. See, there is a scientific process to crafting messages that truly compel someone to apply to your job posting, to fill out the inquiry form on your website, maybe subscribe to your newsletter, uh, to award you the contract and not your competitor. The list goes on. Whether you're hoping to transact in dollars or just in information, there are certain very particular places in your business where the exact words on the page really matter. Now, the technical term for what I'm talking about is conversion copywriting. And the concept is simple. Construct sentences in such a way that makes the reader feel seen and understood and want to interact with you more. Another way to think of this is salesmanship in print. Ami Sanyal is a marketing strategist, the CEO of the Uncommoners Club, his agency, and our conversion copywriter here at Breakthrough Academy. Now, I've worked with him firsthand over the past year and can honestly say he's the most talented person in his craft that I've ever met. Get this, basically overnight, and on the first assignment that we gave him, he more than doubled the conversion rate of our landing pages. And we've since let him loose on a bunch of our other assets, which, by the way, are now all converting orders of magnitude better than they were before. So long story short, if you want to learn how to write job postings that give you an inbox full of resumes, how to write follow-up emails which get excited responses, or how to create website calls to action with get, which get you leads, learning the basics of conversion copy is probably a good idea. And the good news, mastering this craft is a lot easier and more formulaic than you might think. Now, if you are watching this on YouTube and you're not yet subscribed to our awesome channel, hit that subscribe button below. That's enough from me. Let's dive into conversion copy for contractors with Ami Sanyal. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Ami, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, Benji. Thanks for having me. We haven't had a live guest in, the, in a while. It's good to have a warm body back here in the studio. Matt and I have been lonely, so thanks for, <laughs> thanks for showing up. How are you? Great. Fantastic. So um, there is this, uh, this line or this quote that I'm probably going to botch a little bit, but it comes from Donald Miller and that whole kind of story brand philosophy. And I, I remember hearing it in the audio book. And it, what he's saying is... Um, it's the words on the page that get people to take action, not the colors, not the graphics, not the images. And I think what he's saying by that is it's the sentences and the meaning that's conveyed that cause people to transact, not the pretty colors. They complement it, but it's really the words. And, and so my question is, has that been true in your experience? And, and, and if so, why? Yeah, it's a good question. I think a good metaphor for this is if you went to a fancy restaurant, okay, and you look at the menu, and right away there's a picture there that catches your eye. It's a, it's a beautiful dish, right? What do you do next? You look at the description of it. You ask the waiter to tell me a bit more about it. Right. And it's those words that you fundamentally make your decision on. Right. And so I think that's a good parallel to what Donald Miller is trying to say in that book is pictures are important. Your, your brand, your colors, what you choose to share are, is important. But ultimately, what drives people to make a decision is how you phrase your words. So the, all that other stuff is, is complimentary, but the real meaty part, to use the food analogy, is, is the message that's being conveyed through the words. That's right. So can you give us like a boilerplate, like what's, what's Ami's definition of conversion copy? We're going to apply this concept to a few different use cases for a business today, but just like how do we, what, what, if our listeners who are learning about this for the first time, what is conversion copy? Yeah, um, I don't think many people think about it too often, but there's a few different types of writing, okay? So um, are you writing to educate somebody, teach them something? Are you writing to inform them about something or entertain them, right? A lot of the TV shows we're watching right now are written by writers, right? So those are, those are important forms of writing. Conversion copy is a very specific form of writing, which is about persuasion, okay? Can we uh, call somebody to act 
in a way that we want them to. And so where that shows up in our businesses is when we write, um, are we able to make somebody pick up the phone and call us? Right. Or when we write, can we make somebody hit that apply button and apply for a job opening, right? So we're, the, the easy way to figure out if it's conversion copies, if there's a call to action in the post, right? There's a somewhat nerdy um, definition of conversion copy, which is it's salesmanship in print. Yeah. All right. So that's like the, the OG uh, copywriter. I like that. Kind of go, go by that. Uh, if there's a CTA involved, it probably should involve conversion copy. That's a nice heuristic to kind of guide our thinking and to just go through the examples again. So let's think about it, the, the archetypal business that, that you know you and I both work with now. Um, you could be turning a casual website reader into a buyer, right? Call now for an estimate or book, right. schedule your appointment, whatever. Um, you could be turning a uh, a previous customer into a referrer, mm-hmm. right? You could be, uh, you, you use this example already, you, you could be taking a job seeker who's just kind of ch- scrolling through job boards, maybe checking out a couple websites, maybe looking at a company their buddy told them about, you're, you're turning that job seeker into an applicant. So the, I think the central point here is, is like where it is, um, you, you are almost always transacting over something. Yeah. Yeah. Are there places where, so job postings, CTAs on the website, you might be, if your business is a, a little bit more advanced with its marketing, you might be running paid ad campaigns, you'd yeah. be using it there. Landing pages, you may be using it there. Email nurture sequences, sales collateral, those are the things that come to mind for me. Mm-hmm. Are there a couple areas in the brand environment of the businesses that we're talking about where it maybe like isn't so eligible? Like you're not gonna use it on your about us page, I don't right. think. Um, so, you know, not to whack everything with the hammer that I, I have, <laughs> I think there's a place for it in almost every form of writing, including, I was thinking about this on the drive over here today, uh, you know, would you want your SOPs in your business, that's writing, right, uh, to have uh, calls to action all over? Well, kind of on one hand, right? Like, I, I do want people to act on the information and maybe that's taking them to the next step in the training or whatever. But uh, think about it from uh, what is the main purpose of this piece of writing? Mm-hmm. In that case, yes, uh, they may need to act, but I really want them to understand. I want to educate them on on how we do things, our process. So that's a good example of, okay, I'm not going to get too carried away with the call to action. But an About Us page, again, what is the principal point that we're trying to con- convey? We're trying to uh, help them understand who we are, why we're different. So I'm going to have touches. It might even have a call to action on that page, but it might not be the fundamental reason for that page's existence. So understanding w- the role it's playing is really what, what I think is important. Yeah, and uh, like uh, I said this um, in the intro, but f- just for our listeners like to remind you, like, like we work very closely with Ami. He does a tremendous amount of our conversion copywriting for a lot of our, a lot of the marketing stuff we have out there. And I just like, you know, pay you a compliment here. Like when, when you, the stuff that you write, when I read it every time, I'm like, I want that. Like that's, I want that. I'm, I'm convinced. I'm persuaded. Yeah, people don't like to use the word sold anymore, but I am sold. There's always like something about the message where it's, it's hitting on needs. It feels on some level like you're inside my brain or you're inside the brain of our prospect. And that's why, you know, we've seen orders of magnitudes, um, like improvements that are like multipliers better than they were before in terms of like how things convert our registration pages on webinars through the roof, stuff like that. So it's just, I, um, can you talk a little bit about like the high level methodology or the technique that you've learned over the years or that conversion copywriters use that make writing stuff like that so easy for you? Like what's what there's obviously a a process some technique to this. Like what's what have you learned over the years that that makes it possible for you? Yeah, absolutely. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. Okay. So in 2016, I had um, a surgery. Okay, in my leg. Uh, something had to be removed. It's fine. I'm okay. And so, you know, you and I know each other. When I walked in, you weren't like, oh, that guy walks funny, right? So you, you wouldn't know necessarily that, that there's anything going on. However, um, sometimes when I'm like laying on the couch uh, at my house, my eight-year-old will run at me and he'll like hit my leg funny and I'll like yelp out in pain, okay? And um, the metaphor here is that a good writer will tap into those kind of hidden pains, those hidden desires that you don't share with most people. Right. 
and it makes you feel seen. Okay. So what I like to say is that my best copy isn't, isn't created. It's stolen, but I don't steal it from other writers. I steal it from the reader. Okay. So what that means is I have a very deep understanding of who that reader is. Right. All right. So Abe Lincoln's got the quote, you know, if you want to chop a tree down, you got an hour, you're going to spend 45 right. minutes uh, on the ax, right? right? Sharpening it up. For us as copywriters, what that means is I'm going to spend most of my time really understanding who it is I'm trying to influence. Okay. So that is really interesting. The, the phrase you used, which I, I love, is it makes them feel seen. Mm. And the way to do that is to essentially steal the words straight from their mouth. Yep. Or if you're really good at it, straight from their brain. Because yeah. they may not even be like talking about it openly. Yeah. So here's my, how do you go about extracting that? It's, if it's like this buried in there thing of theirs, what's the process? What's the rigorous steps you follow to kind of extract that? So then the writing later on, that 25% where you actually are putting pen to page is a lot easier and you're capturing the right stuff. Yeah, it's an exciting question because I think a lot of um, contractors will feel a little bit overwhelmed with any sort of marketing writing, any sort of writing that's forward facing in the sure. business, because, hey, like we didn't get into the business to become like great writers. And the reason why that that feeling is there is often we think of writing as this big creative task. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you have a method, a framework for it, we can shift away from like, OK, I need to uh, have this kind of madman approach to to creating ads or, or job postings and just keep it really simple. And that's that's what I'll share right now is the methodology. And so. I said we want to get to know our, our prospect, our reader. The way that we do that in our agency is two, two things, okay? The first thing we'll do is we'll survey real people who match that persona. So as an example, if you're about to you know, create an ad for your company, instead of just kind of drumming up an ad or hiring an agency to do that, you go out and you speak to the five best customers you've ever had. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you can ask them questions that are going to help you understand them on a deeper level, how they phrase their pains, how they phrase the transformation that they were looking for when they came to you. Um, also, what concerns or objections are they kind of dealing with or were they dealing with and how did you overcome those? Right. Uh -huh. So I'm really looking for how they phrase it. And I'm actually recording their responses instead of taking bullet notes because I'll, I'll put it in my own kind of uh professional speak and that's not what we want. We want them to say exactly what they were thinking and we're going to use that later on. Okay. So that's kind of step one, right? Is this survey that we go through. And I, I don't mean go and speak to a hundred people. Five is a good number because it's, it's, uh, it's achievable, but it'll give you a good amount of information and pattern building to start with. Um, that's a lunch, a Zoom call, a phone call, something where you go in with some questions and you're ready to really focus, actively listen and take notes. Yep. And and like, I like that. You're saying five, like that's, that's, that's maybe it. use that rule of thumb. Five interviews is going to give you enough color, enough story, enough narrative to draw from when you go to write. Yeah. Um, so when I share this with business owners, we do, we, we do a bit of training and they're like, okay, how do I ask this? Um, I don't want to come off as, uh, you know, bugging, bugging my best clients or whatever. And the way that frame this is always uh, for the service of the client. So what you would say, you reach out to your client and say, listen, um, we're, we're growing the business and we want to make sure we're serving you at the highest level. I'd love to, you know, either take you out for coffee or just record a 15 minute Zoom call, no preparation required, where we'll ask you some simple questions. It's going to help us provide service at a higher level. Mm -hmm. And also we want to attract other great clients just like yourself. So yeah. if you were doing this as a marketing exercise, you were writing, um, you know, client facing copy, you'd be doing with the, doing this with clientele. If you were doing this with a, uh, like you were wanting to write better job ads, and I think we're going to go through a detailed example later. Are you literally going out and meeting job seekers? Are you meeting, uh, past employees? Like who's the right person to extract information from in that example? Yeah, fantastic question. Best case scenario. You've got a couple guys on your team who, who are the right type of people that you're looking to clone, you're going to speak to them, right? Okay. Um, and they might be past employees. If that's not the case, like, hey, I don't really like the people on my team right now. Who am I going to talk to? <laughs> well, think about the people in your network, right? Like, who would you, who do you look at? And you're like, man, you guys have the best crew. Um, you, can you, do you know somebody in your network that you can speak to uh -huh. that fits that mold? You don't want to 
again, this is not creative writing, right? Stop like trying to imagine what they're going to say and go talk to the right people. So if you need to do a little bit of reaching out, then then do that. I think in a way it's kind of, it's kind of a relief to hear that. I think that when you're as busy uh, as an entrepreneur is and you have as many plates spinning as you do, I think um, even the more creative ones probably find the moments where there's like deep work and ability to focus and write something out that's beautiful is like just seems impossible to pin down. So when you kind of say, hey, this is more of a rote process, this is a methodology, this is a little bit more of like a science experiment than it is a creative endeavor, um, kind of takes some pressure off. Yeah, that's the idea for sure. So when you're, when, so okay, you, you're, you're doing these interviews, what kind of stuff are you trying to extract in particular? Yeah, so three things, right? We want to understand the pain in, in the way that they phrase it. So um, a job seeker might be feeling stuck. They might not like the pay that they're getting. They might not like certain scenarios in, that happen in the workplace. So we want to understand those in, in, in the way that they phrase it. We also want to understand like what their, their deep desire is. What is the transformation that, that they're looking for that, that you're going to be able to deliver on, right? So again, how are they phrasing that, that desire? And then the last thing, if possible, we want to ex extract um, what are the common concerns? You know, in salesmanship, it's objections. That's what, that's what we call it. I love calling it a concern because an objection is something to be handled. A concern is something to be resolved. And we want our, our copy later on to really address each of these concerns in a, in a really clean way. And so these people are really good sources for those concerns. As well. Can we linger on this concept of pain for a second? Like, uh, <clears throat> this is just interesting. And if, you, if you've done sales training, like Sandler sales, they'll say this all the time, like sell to pain. It's, uh, you talk to marketers and they bring up the same thing. Can you, like, what's your just take on the psychology there? Like, why is capturing that so important in the context of conversion copy? Yeah, I think it's rooted in psychology, right? So um, pain is something that human beings are programmed to avoid. Yeah. And it's, it's survival, right? So when we see it in our daily lives now, when somebody's um, kind of twists a knife on something that is, is, is an active pain and a big one in our lives, we pay attention. So that's a big um, battle in a world full of noise, right? Can we even get people to pause long enough to look at what we have to say, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's it, right? And uh, I mentioned, you know, my leg, like that, that physical and emotional response is really what we're trying to elicit. And it gets people to lean in, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we want. We don't want just a casual... Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Like we see a ton of ads, ton of ton of random stuff, and we're just going to skip over ninety nine point nine percent of it. Mm -hmm. But if something calls me out by name, almost, then uh, I'm going to pay attention. And that yeah, because it feels way. personal. It feels like okay, this this ad, this just job posting, whatever. This is talking to me because I feel that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You have a bit of a like a bit of a framework. I don't know if we did we print it off. You've yep. got this like sort of pain, want, empathy thing. Do you want to just take us through kind of how that table or how that way of analyzing it works? Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, I've already said we do surveys with five people and we're pulling out pain, want, and um, their concerns. Right. Yeah. We're going to augment that with some research. So, mm -hmm. you know, hitting up the internet really is what that looks like. And you're going to have forums, you're going to have Facebook groups, you're going to maybe even, um, uh, you know, association uh, pages, whatever it is. And you're, you're going to complement what you've dis discerned from those surveys. Okay. What we do is we put that on a, uh, a document called our language building blocks. And we do this for every new client, every new project that we work on. Um, and I, I, I teach this to small business owners as a way to simplify their writing as well. So we've already got half the work done if we put each of these kind of phrases in its own cell, just as they've been phrased by the client or the prospect. Now, the next stage is to complement that. And that's where you come in, right? So you look at the listed pains, you look at the listed results or transformations, and you look at the concerns. Um, what is the credibility that we can speak to that's going to be relevant here? All right, so you're a contractor. Um, well, maybe you've won some awards or maybe you've done like one really badass project that, that everybody, if they just see this thing, they're going to be like, this guy's a real deal, right? So um, what are the credibility pieces for you? Consider that, put it in, even if it's obvious, even if you think it's stupid, just put it in uh, on this grid, okay? Next, you're going to talk about empathy. So when somebody shares a pain, um, if your buddy comes to you and be like, I'm dealing with a problem, you're going to show them empathy. That's a human thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, organizations 
big and small, have trouble with this. And they so do. when we can put empathy into our writing, it's a really easy way to stand out and be a human being about it. So you're going to feel better about the, the, the work you're producing as well. So what does empathy look like? Okay, so if somebody says, um, I, I am not getting paid enough, well, could you talk about a story, even just in this grid? Maybe it doesn't end up in the ad, but about how you had a job once that that really they underpaid you, the boss just avoided um, even conversations around pay. Like everybody has this sort of sure. thing, right? So tap into it. Um, when it. When you have it, that can be one of the strongest points to create a connection with your, your reader, mm -hmm. all right? So now you've got um, a, a good amount of credibility bullets written down, you've got a good amount of empathy bullets written down. This is when you start forming your ideas around how you're going to speak about the offer and the hooks that you're going to bring people in. And so now you're going to end up with a, a grid we can show we can show people um, where I've got a whole table of, of these cells with great sentences yeah. on them. This is the source of the writing. And so I actually, when I teach this to people, I say, don't think of this as writing. You're actually just sorting these blocks. And you have like an infinite variety of pieces of content, ads, job postings that you can test now that are grounded in real phrases and, and data that you've gathered. You're like extracting it from the persona. You get it in the cells, which by the way, guys, this this language building blocks thing that Ami has mentioned, we'll make that available in the description if you want to download an example and this is something you can take home and play around with yourself. It's just very simple, very clean. It'll totally show you how this framework actually works. Um, but you're extracting and you're assembling more than anything. Yep. You're not you're not writing from a blank canvas. You don't need to come up with this new and compelling. It's just like, what did they say? Okay, they said this, it goes here. They yep. said this other thing, it goes there. And then you go, and then you pull from that table and basically put the puzzle pieces together. And there's, you wordsmith it a little, yeah. maybe put some, you know, grammarly it sure. or do a spell check, but there's your job posting. There's your paid ad. Exactly. There's your landing page, whatever. The cool thing about this is even if you, don't run it through Grammarly. Do it, obviously. <laughs> but even if you didn't, like if you compare a really well polished, uh, perfect grammar piece of content to something that is not polished, that is built with this framework, that one's going to win because it's grounded in, in psychology. It's grounded in things that people care about, not in like perfect English. Nobody wants to read your essay. They want to understand if you're relevant to their situation and you can do something for them. So the emotion you're extracting in the message matters more than the commas. That's right. Interesting. Um, did you did we talk about the hook and crafting a good hook or a CTA? Is that, is that worth dwelling on? Or if you want to do the example, yeah, we can we can touch on it and we can dig in to the example as well. But um, basically, one of the things that I would stress is we want to call out a very specific reader. Um, almost in the first line, like as early as possible, sometimes the first word, because this is a really important moment where somebody's just going to decide, do I keep, do I keep browsing? Do I, you know, scroll up, scroll by, or do I pay attention? And so your hook is, or your headline is going to be some of the most important pieces of copy that you write, um, to, to make people pay attention to the rest. And so a really good way to think about any, t any form of writing that you do is that the headline's job is to make people pay attention and, and go to the article, go to the um, job posting ad, whatever. The first line, that has a job too. It's to make them read the second line. And we just keep on going down this kind of, um, this road yeah. until we're getting to the call to action. Where right. we're now, we've done our job. We've, we've, we've dealt with all the pieces we've talked about, the pain, the credibility, the, the empathy, the, all of these things. Now we're ready to say, this is what we want you to do. And yeah. now that's an action piece, right? So that's how I like to to see that they're on the opposite ends of the spectrum, right? You've got the hook on the, on the top and you've got the calls to action on the bottom. Um, we, we have this, ex like we're going to do this like fun little example. Sure. So we, we, we just like kind of did a little bit of Googling, downloaded a random job posting. And what we'll do is read through it. And then maybe we can just pick up on like, you know, two or three things that we would improve based on this framework that we just, that we just went through. Sure. So give it a read. Give it a read. Okay. I'm not going to call this person out uh, by name, but uh, yeah, so this is a job post we found on Indeed. So um, uh, very common style, right? So this is for a uh, carpenter, I believe. 
So it says general contractor looking for a renovation carpenter with strong framing and finishing skills. The successful applicant must be competent renovating and constructing wood frame houses. We are serious students of the craft of renovation and construction. We take a conscientious approach to every project and we aim to provide a high level of personalized service to our clients. All of our employees must be able to talk to our clients in a friendly and professional manner. Our livelihoods depend on positive word of mouth. This is the mindset you must have. Ideally, you have both finishing and framing carpentry skills. We are excited to teach and learn from you. We are a learning organization and aim to use best practices. We pay competitive hourly rates based on skill level, work ethic, and attitude. Most of our projects are residential renovations, although we do some basic commercial work as well. The majority of our work is in the city of whatever, and employees must have a reliable vehicle and driver's license to commute to work. Please include a cover letter and write a brief message telling us why you're interested in the job. We look forward to hearing from you. For, main, for, for more information, visit this website and our Instagram, uh, so on. Okay. okay. So let's start with the good. Let's give them a couple, let's give them a couple of compliments. There's okay. a couple good things in there. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is. Um, so I think there is uh, a line in here that I actually like. Um, it's actually not a part of the main job post. Oh, it's in the back here. So it says here in the application questions, what is the coolest project you've worked on? I actually really like that because it taps into somebody's pride. Um, you're, you're tapping into kind of something that people will, will pay attention to. You have outlined, um, the, the necessary skills, um, that you're looking for. Um, those are the things that I would say like stand out. Yeah, like, you know, there, there's so so we're going to pick this apart as we often do on this show. So sure. I, there's a couple of things I just want to, like, say are good. Uh, we're serious students of the craft. I mean, that's that's a nice that's a nice piece to just talk about. You know, you, you your values, you, you value mastery. Um, um, we're excited to teach you. We're a coaching organization. Um, they said something about their approach. There's some good descriptive language there about who they are that that um, a, cer- a certain profile of job seeker is going to look at and be like, okay, I care about that stuff too. Maybe this is for me. But mm-hmm. if, if this business owner was standing here instead of me and they said, Ami, what would, would, you know, give me a few things that I could do to just make this twice as effective on whatever job board it's sitting on. Yeah. What stands out is obvious to you. Okay. The first thing I'll point out um, is the first line. Okay, so we have here, it says general contractor looking for a renovation carpenter with a strong framing and finishing skill. Okay, what's wrong with that? Okay, you're starting with you, right? Like um, you as in the contractor. We, we need to identify who we're speaking to and speak in terms that they want to hear from us. Right. Okay, so um, if you look at this this job post, I'm trying to count as, as we're talking here, the amount of we's and R's mm. off the charts. I think there's like a dozen times where it's like, we do this, uh, our livelihoods depend on it, <laughs> uh, all of this stuff. And it's like, the, the guy you're talking to doesn't care about you. You know what I mean? They care about themselves. Okay, that's a really important point you just said. Yep. It's a they care about their pains and their problems first yeah. and foremost. Yeah. Our, um, I don't know if you've met our, our coach Charlie, who works with us on on the podcast. But he he when it, we, I'll show him some stuff sometimes that I put together, and he says the way he describes his phenomenon. He goes, Benji, you're wee wee weeing all over the place. There you go. And yeah. I, said, I was like, what do you mean? Like, like what do you mean? I, I wet myself. He's not like you're saying wee 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 yep. all the time. You you open and finish in the middle. All of it is just you talking about yourself. So that's a first. That's a, that's a red flag there. Don't Huge wee 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 all over the place. Absolutely. I mean, this line in particular encapsulates what I'm talking about. Our livelihoods depend on positive word of mouth. This is the mindset you must have. That's a pretty presumptuous thing. It's like, I don't even work for you yet. You're telling me what my mindset needs to be? Like, I get it. I understand what they're trying to communicate here. But um, the ideal prospect needs to first buy into that this is even for them. And they've done a pretty weak job of that. Now, I think that lines like that that you just pointed out, what was it again? Our livelihoods depend on positive word of mouth. This is the so, mindset you must have. This is the, okay. So what? Where stuff? Um, I think I think business owners put lines like that, um, and it can take many forms. But they put it in there because they've had a bad experience with an employee who didn't have that. Yeah. And so they're like, let me be really clear. Sure. Let me be super explicit up front because so and so two years ago really screwed us. Totally. It's almost like their trauma is showing up in the writing. Yeah, absolutely. And 
That's good. I think any time that we have a problem in our business, it's pretty big. Our business is telling us something, right? So you do need to make things, uh, you know, make changes in the business to address that. It's how you do it that matters. Um, was there anything else in the original job posting structurally or in terms of the words and sentences that are used that you just kind of, that stood out as, as could be easily improved? Yeah. Um, so the first like easy thing to understand here, just, just dealing with this first sentence is how do we identify the person right off the bat? A sentence that I would put together is something like, are you a carpenter with 15 years of experience? Right? If you are a carpenter with 15 years of experience, you're gonna be like, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're right away. Gonna, it's not. It's not super flashy. It's not the mm -hmm. most sexy piece of writing, but but it's clear. It's clear, and you're gonna be like, "Yep, that's me. Yeah. Let's go." Right? And so you can reframe the the elements of this ad to to make sense for the person reading it. So I actually kind of before before we recorded, I, I spent a few minutes kind of drumming up a fictional version of, of what our language building blocks might look okay. like and and put together um, just a, a, a couple bullets. It's not a complete job ad, but I'll just read you what I wrote down, okay? Okay, so it says, are you a carpenter with 15 plus years of experience? Do you want to advance your career by learning new skills with a crew you like to work with? Do you want to have a predictable schedule working on interesting renovations, new builds, and commercial projects that you can be proud of? Do you want to get paid what you're worth and be rewarded with great benefits, perks, and performance bonuses? And then it can go on to describe the company, um, perhaps the the values as they relate to um, the the prospect. So you know, paying well, no drama, pushing the industry forward, that type of thing. These are things that you know, hardworking uh, craftsmen they want in their in their work. Mm -hmm. All right. Another thing I'd like to address is uh, this isn't for everybody. This is an idea. People don't like cover letters. <laughs> they don't like resumes. And if you have a problem uh, finding good talent, getting you know your inbox full of good applications, make it easy for them. Mm. So a line I, I would consider throwing in here is no resumes or cover letters are required to be considered for this position. Great carpenters deserve great careers and the co compensation they need to live the lifestyle they want here in the Lower Mainland. Mm. Click apply now below and fill in a short form to get started. Um, well, let's come back to the like the do you add friction? Do you reduce friction thing uh, in a sec? You put a line there that says, uh, do you want to get paid what you're worth? Mm -hmm. What there's something significant about that. Like, was there you know, like, why did you put that line in there? What kind of heartstrings are you trying to pull on? Yeah, I think I mean, again, I, I did. I broke the rules. I didn't speak to anybody in preparation for this. But if I were to speak to a, a great carpenter, and I know a few, um, that's something that they would say to their buddy, right? Or they might say to their wife, like, man, I, I work really hard. I just I just don't know why it's so hard for me to get, like, a decent pay. Like, this city is so expensive, inflation, blah, blah, blah. Like, why why can't I, I get that? That's the questions that they're asking themselves. Maybe they don't even verbalize it because they're so hardworking. They don't want to come off as complaining, but they're definitely thinking it. Back to the resume and cover letter thing. Um, certainly someone listening is going like, what are you talking about? You want like, that's like the most important part. How am I going to review their their CV? How am I going to see their work experience? Um, and and, and there, there's some legitimate concerns totally. there. Do, you, do what and we've had? We've had I've had guests on that kind of weigh in on both sides of this. Um, I had a great conversation, I think, late last year with a guy named Jody, who's like, forget the resume, forget the cover letter, push everyone to a type form, make yep. it super easy to fill out. You have uniform information. It takes them much less time to complete it. Yeah. And like, I'm, he, he's like the, super bullish on like no, ref, no, uh, no friction recruiting is kind of what we called it. Yeah. What, what's your take on that little mechanism? Have them, don't have them. Yeah. You might. Just, my take is it depends where you're at as a business. If you have a steady flow of job applicants and you're like, we have too many, mm -hmm. then you want to increase friction, right? You might actually say, hey, send a video along with it or uh, send a portfolio of your, of your work, like photographs, whatever. That's increasing friction. You're going to reduce the amount of applicants and make your job easier. If you have the opposite problem and you're like, I, I can't seem to get enough applicants. Where do these where do these guys go? Like yeah. it used to be so easy. Now it's hard. Um, well, you want to reduce friction to make sure that people aren't, you know, basically sitting on the toilet, looking at your job posting and be <laughs> like, Oh, uh, this is going to take too long. I don't want to, I don't want to put together this resume. It's too much work. And, and you know, it's probably not going to work out anyway. So you make it super easy. Like I've said a type form here. Um, 
but you could even make it easier. Like conceptually, you could just make it a chat. Like, hey, all you have to do is is um, click this button, and we'll we'll have a quick conversation by text or whatever. Like, there, there's you could automate that if you really want to get technical, right? But so you you want to think about again, what is the concern? What is the objection yeah. that somebody is dealing with? And there's a bunch that you can smooth over um, in in here in the job. job so. So we use this like totally random one we pulled off the internet. We highlighted a couple of things that could be improved. Do you want to speak maybe just more broadly about the common mistakes? This sort of represents a very archetypal job posting that floats out there. And it's not unique to construction, by the way, guys. You'll see this in almost every industry. Are there kind of just like big patterns or big mistakes that you... We mentioned the wee wee weeing all over the place. Like... Are there other things that you just see people very commonly do wrong that are super easy fixes when it comes to their conversion copy? Yeah. The thing to reflect on here is that people who are overwhelmed with copy, they they usually do two things. Either they're going to copy, like literally copy what's out there. Like, you know, in the case of a job ad, they're going to go on Indeed. Um, they need an office administrator. They're going to like find an office admin ad. They're going to copy that, change out a couple words, and on and off they go. Or they're going to like just kind of drum up, kind of off the cuff, uh, whatever they think is going to work. And unfortunately, both of those are not effective strategies because a lot of times the stuff that's out there isn't working for the company that you're copying it from, right? right. And so um, I think that's a fundamental thing just to like just reflect on, right? Uh, if what you're doing isn't working and it's not working for the other person, then don't, don't keep doing that, right? So what uh, I think you're asking for is, is are there any like quick takeaways? I would say that speaking to one person is a really good habit to get into. Um, Versus, sorry, speaking to many. And we're talking about like literally the pronouns that are used in yeah. the sentences. Yeah. So you say you, say you mm -hmm. not them or you guys or a gen, like you're the, the, the actual, like the uh, words that go on the page need to be sort of singular and directed at one individual person. That's what you're saying, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I had a client uh, who did a, a, a video um, VSL, a video sales letter. And this is the first line was, Hey everyone. Right. And right away that's saying that this is to an audience. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is some guy talking to an audience. Mm. But if, if that person had said, um, if you are right, like if you, if he'd identified that person right away, it's, it's again, it's using that you sentence. It, sometimes I like to use somebody's name and copy, right? Like that we can do that with things like email, um, and other, other tools. So the more specific that you can be uh, on the or the reader that you're writing to, the better. And ideally, it should feel like one person talking to another person. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation that will be almost rude to break up by walking away, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's just sort of human behavior, right? We we appreciate and value things that are for us, mm -hmm. and we appreciate and value things when when people are being real with us or they're speaking to me as a human being. So speak to one person. What else? I would say that um, we really want to uh, remember to understand that relationships of sentences. I already reflected on that um, earlier in, in, in saying, okay, this this sentence needs to needs to be so good that somebody couldn't walk away, right? It needs to be uh, so strong that I'm going to read the next one. So really, that simplifies writing in general. Is just like, okay, I, 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 does this sentence make me want to walk away? Like, just stop. It's boring, <laughs> or I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. And I think that really links well to my next point, which is sometimes you'll get to the end of this process of, of using the language building blocks and you're like, oh, this is really long. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've addressed every concern here and now this piece of writing is twice as long as what I'm seeing out there. Bless you. Excuse me. Um, and so that's a common concern with, with business owners is like, this is never going to work. It's way too long. I wouldn't read this, right? Um, and what I would say to that is there's no such thing as copy that's too long, writing that's too long. It is only writing that's too boring. <laughs> right. right. Well, okay, so what makes things boring? Again, it's about relevancy, right? Are you tapping into something that matters to the person? Is a sentence that you, you made me read making me feel seen, heard, and it's related to what outcome that I want in my life? Mm-hmm. So not too long, just too boring and irrelevance in your opinion is like the number one thing that creates boredom yep. in, in the writing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, anything else? Just like practical quick, hit, quick hits? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you are like, okay, I don't have time for all this stuff. Um, one really good thing is you can 
you know, go through the exercise of putting together that like language building blocks and then use voice to text tools to actually um, produce the writing. And that's going to be really good because, you know, not, not everybody listening here is going to be like, oh, I'm a really great writer. But everybody here communicates every single day. We talk to our wives, we talk to our staff, like whatever it is. Um, and so we're comfortable with that, right? So using voice to text tools to create that kind of crappy first draft is a really um, fast way to produce uh, writing that's actually quite strong. What we're talking when we say voice to text is you are talking into a phone or a computer yeah. and it's recording and converting to text. Yeah. And with and with where technology is at today, those are widely available. I think Google has a dictate option you can find. It's literally just Google how to use Google Docs for dictation. Otter.ai is another good one. There's thousands of things out there that will help you that, with this. But you're saying the, the initial brain dump, which yeah. is where I think a lot of people get stuck and don't ever move past because yeah. It's just, it's overwhelming. Yep. It's a blank canvas. It's an empty document. Where do I even start? If you just kind of go from the dome into your phone and yep. then look at what you have, you could, if you've done the research well, you could potentially literally just like edit f straight from there and have something that's totally viable. Yeah. Absolutely. Huge time saver. Absolutely. And it's also a little bit more natural to think about this as if you were like, you know, having drinks with somebody, right? Like you're, you're actually talking to somebody or you're like calling your buddy on the phone. Like how would you phrase it then? Because you're going to use different types of words instead of falling into corporate speak, even small, right. small companies, we, we tend to tend to just gravitate to where is that. So, so, weird. so yeah, if you're just like, okay, how would I say this to, you know, a very specific person I have in mind, Mark, you know what I mean? How would I talk to Mark if I was trying to recruit him again? Right. Or well, how would I talk about this to, you know, that homeowner that was so fantastic? How would I do it? Mm -hmm. Um, so that would be uh, a really cool tool. Um, and it's like native in most most uh, pieces of technology now, so you don't have to look far. Um, and then the final thing I would say is, you know, if you're overwhelmed by this stuff, like just become a student of it. And the way to do that is to create what we call a swipe file in, in marketing, right? So just if you see a good piece of advertising or a great job ad that made you pay attention, then just file it away. You don't have to do much else. If it's a folder on your on your on your computer or Evernote or whatever you use, I don't really care. It's just get in the habit of saying, "Oh, this made me pay attention. Right. This made me buy something or sign up for something or whatever." Just save that, especially if you're like, "Oh, this has been running a really long time." When things run a really long time, they're making they money for somebody. So, so that's a really simple way to get better at writing is just paying attention to what makes you lean in. Interesting. So what, if that term swipe file is just a marketing term for like a folder on your computer where yeah. you put stuff that you liked for inspiration later. Yeah, exactly. It gives you the frameworks, right? So then you can be like, oh, this worked really well. I'm going to take the, the psychology aspects of this or the actual frameworks, the layout of this, and I'm going to use it for my next thing. Um, you made a comment there. Things that have been going for a while is sort of proof that they're making money because marketers aren't stupid. They wouldn't run a campaign for four years in a row if it yep. was not giving them an ROI. Yeah. So if you've seen a commercial for like four football seasons in a row, because these Quest Trade ads are just like crushing right now, and I'm always like, man, okay, yeah. they've done eight different spins on this, and they clearly have the profile dialed. They clearly have the pain point dialed. I mean, that's a TV commercial. Yeah. It's not exactly what we're talking, about, but there's like, I. You know, that's, what, that's in, what's in my swipe file. Sure. I'm like, these guys have something really figured out here. And I could come up with other examples too. But I, I like that idea of just paying attention to what makes you want to transact, what catches your attention. Yeah, a great place to start if you're a podcast listener is like, hey, I've been listening to podcasts for like seven years and this one ad has been running the entire time. You know what I mean? And so Athletic it's like, Greens. yeah, there it is, right? Yeah. Like, And it's like, it hasn't even changed. They haven't done anything new. Yeah. It's the same damn ad, right? Yeah. And as much as it's a little bit frustrating almost to hear the same thing over and over, it's working. Right. You know what I mean? And so it's, 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 uh, it's a really simple way to start thinking about this. Any like books that you would, books, podcasts, I don't know, just bits of content. If someone's reading this and they, they understand, okay, I really need to get better at this quickly. Is there anything just that you'd advise as homework? Yeah, I think we, we started this podcast with um, reflecting on the story brand. And so that's a nice accessible book. Um, that talks about things like the the story arc um, that Pixar uses as an example. So that's a good a good primer on on writing in specific. But I actually when I when I recommend books, I don't necessarily recommend nerdy copy books because I don't think everybody out there is trying to become a copywriter. I I recommend uh, an oldie but a goodie, but how to win friends and influence people. Still, still, right? And if you think about it, it's in the title, right? We're trying to influence people. 
Right. And so uh, a lot of the main bullets of 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 that book of saying, can we get people to um, say yes? Right? Uh, can we use people people's names? Like those principles are are things we can apply directly to our writing. And what's cool about it is that we can use it in other parts of our lives as well. Story brand, how to win friends and influence people. Um, this has been great, man. I, I think uh, a lot of our listeners need to become uh, salesmen in their print, saleswomen in their print. And this is, well, we use the job posting example, and that's a very tangible uh, one to think of. But parts of your website, ads you run, landing pages you have, email reminders and nurture sequences. There's so many things in your business, even a small one, that have text on a page that's designed to get someone to do something. And I feel really strongly that this is massively overlooked. So this is a really, really great kind of first crack at this conversation. But if people want to reach out to you or follow your journey or just kind of connect um, in any way, what's the best place to do that, Ami? Yeah, the best thing to do would be to go out on LinkedIn and, and look up my name, Ami Sanyal. Um, and uh, reach out. If you've got questions or you want to apply this in different ways, I'm happy to have a quick chat, um, even if it's just informally. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for the invite. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.